Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope we're all feeling sufficiently caffeinated because it's definitely that time of day, but we're almost there. We just got a few talks left. Um, I'm Colin Grove. I'm a research lead with Hydra DX, and I'm going to talk through how to build a block for an automated market maker. Okay. Now first, uh, well, as we go through how to build a block for an automated market maker, um, we're going to talk, we're going to touch on some things that you've probably heard about in, uh, if you've been paying any attention to DeFi, uh, like just-in-time liquidity, oracles, uh, liquidations. Um, but we're going to do this all in the context of talking through how do we build a block or how do we appropriately constrain the building of blocks for automated market makers? Okay. Now, I do want to give a quick disclaimer. This is not a roadmap for Hydra DX or our Kusama Parachain uh, Basilisk. Um, I'm a researcher. This is an ideas talk. Um, so yeah, especially by the end, we'll get into some topics where you know, there are ideas out there. It's a little less clear how you actually bring the implementation piece. OK. Now, uh, before we get to building blocks, we first need to talk about what is an automated market maker? Well, first of all, it's a mouthful. So what is an AMM? OK, AMM is short for automated market maker. What is an AMM? For this talk, an automated market maker, or AMM for short, is a protocol which facilitates the peer-to-peer -peer swapping of different tokens. OK, so I'm defining this a little narrowly, deliberately. Um, for examples, you know, common examples you can think of, Uniswap, Curve, these types of AMMs. OK. Now, uh, these types of decentralized AMMs have typically two types of users, two main types of users. They have the liquidity providers, or LPs, and they have the traders. Now, the liquidity providers provide tokens to the liquidity pool, right? And in return, they get ownership tokens back. Traders, meanwhile, can trade with that liquidity pool anytime they want. So the traders are determining the timing of these transactions. The liquidity providers are not. And so the traders are paying a fee, typically, to the liquidity providers, because um, liquidity providers, it's sort of out of their control when these trades happen. The automated market maker, however, the algorithm or the protocol is setting the price. OK, so LPs provide their assets knowing what algorithm will set the price. So again, the automated market maker is that algorithm, right, or that protocol that sets the price for these transactions. OK, so before we get, <laughs> this is the last preamble slide, I promise. Before we get to how to build an a, a block for an AMM, I want to mention the most important things we'll ignore here. So if you're going to build a blockchain for, uh, that's specifically an AMM, you need a couple things. The first thing you need is you need other blockchains to exist that do other things, right? If you don't have any other blockchains that exist, what's, what's, what's anyone going to use your AMM for, right? I mean, sure, they can create tokens, they can trade them, they can, they can speculate on numbers going up and down for no reason. Who would do that? Nobody's going to do that, right? So you need other blockchains in the space. Um, secondly, you need to be able to safely and securely transfer tokens from other blockchains to your blockchain AMM and back, right? Because again, no one's going no one's going to transfer tokens or try across unsecure, unsafe or centralized bridges, right? That would be that would be crazy. If we don't expect or if we don't want users to be doing those things, 
we have to have these properties. And Polkadot's shared security model and messaging protocol give us these. And so that makes Polkadot a really good ecosystem to build an AMM chain. Okay. All right. So what do we mean by building a block? A block builder or block producer decides how to fill the block with transactions, right? Now, uh, if, the blocks, if the blocks on your blockchain are every six seconds, you actually only have a small fraction of that to process transactions. So you might have, say, as short as half a second of what we call execution time, right? Um, and so that is the space. And when we say space, we're really talking about processing time. That's the space uh, that the block producer can fill. Now, if we impose no special constraints on the block producer, the block producer or block builder can profit in a number of ways. For example, let's think about how they will decide to process this blue swap. Well, a swap has what's known as a slippage limit. So this is the worst price that the trader who submitted that swap is willing to pay. That's a constraint. And if that constraint isn't satisfied in the way that the uh, block producer has filled the block, the block is invalid. Right? So that's one constraint that the block producer has. The block producer might be uh, evaluating different transactions, like this blue swap, um, by, based on other things like fees. Right? So there may be some portion of the fee that uh, goes to the block producer as a tip. And I think we can expect them to, to try to maximize those fees. But on most chains, the block producer can also inject their own transactions. Okay. Now, if you recall, traders pay liquidity providers a fee because liquidity providers don't get to choose when their assets are traded, right? But a block producer can make this yellow trade be a liquidity add. So they're adding tokens to that liquidity pool. And then immediately afterwards, in the green trade, they can remove them. And they can submit those transactions knowing exactly when and where and at what prices their assets will be traded. Okay. So this is called just-in-time liquidity. And it is one example of minor extractable value, or MEV, which is a name I'll continue to use, um, though it comes from when all block producers were miners. Um, And this, especially on AMMs where um, those liquidity transactions have additional sort of degrees of freedom. So for example, on AMMs where you have concentrated liquidity, where you, the block producer can concentrate that liquidity for the specific swap, you can actually, the block producer can ex extract quite a bit of profit this way. So what can we do? Well, on an AMM chain, we can do something very simple. We can say liquidity transactions have to happen after swap transactions. So the block producer or anyone else can still add and remove liquidity in one block, but they're not going to make any money, right? Because there's no swaps between it, between their transactions. So um, this is a very simple constraint. Right? But by adding a constraint on the block producer that is specific to our use case, specific for our AMM, we obtain some better um, incentives here. All right. Um, another example of something you can do with a uh, AMM-specific blockchain is uh, you can you can you can uh, 
sort of have some sense of the passage of time in a way that you can't on a general purpose blockchain as easily, right? So, for example, there are a number of types of oracles, of averaging oracles, where you want to track some sort of data on uh, your, some sort of data on your chain. And we'd like to do some computation every block. On general purpose blockchains, you usually have to do this in particular transactions, or you have to do some tricks to do it only the first, you know, once each block, but still in response to a transaction. But on a AMM specific blockchain, you can simply reserve some space at the, say, end of each block and do your processing there. So once again, this is a type of structure or constraint that we are adding to uh, that's specific for our application, that's specific for our AMM. Now let's suppose that our AMM specific blockchain also has some form of over collateralized uh, lending. Think about what happens in a sudden market move. Right? Increased trading volume, borrowers trying to add collateral to their positions, people trying to sort of flight to quality, people are moving to safer assets, liquidation transactions, there's suddenly a lot more demand for block space. Liquidation transactions are transactions that sell collateral from barely over collateralized positions. And they, the hope is that they will sell that in time before prices can decrease, if they're going to continue to do that, to get the full loan value back, right? So time is of the essence with liquidations. And you need, you, you have the most demand for these transactions at the same time as block space is the most expensive. So in an AMM blockchain, something you could do is prioritize liquidations. Now, this is a very oversimplified way to do that, right? You, but an option would be to simply reserve some block space and say, you know, this, this is block space that you cannot use for anything other than liquidations. Now, that's almost certainly too simplified for a real world use case, but that sort of illustrates the point, right? That illustrates another way we can constrain the production of blocks specific to an AMM, or in this case, an AMM with some lending product. So now we are prioritizing liquid liquidation transactions, we're putting liquidity transactions after swaps, and we're doing some Oracle post-processing. We haven't really touched the swaps, right? In particular, the block producer can still put the swaps in whatever order they wish. Now, uh, if you're familiar at all with DeFi, you probably have heard of sandwich attacks, right? And this is where, once again, the, uh, the block producer can inject their own transactions in the block exactly where they want them. Now, for a sandwich attack, they inject a swap immediately before and immediately after some other large swap, and they make sure that that trader gets that worst price. The worst price that they're willing to take, that's what the trader gets, and the block producer gets the profit, right? The discrepancy between that worst price and the actual price on chain. Now, there's a few little ways, sort of little ways you can fix this. I say little, but I mean, this is an important issue, right? So there's a lot of solutions out there for this, but I'm going to jump straight to what I would say is the ideal case, even though it's a little bit farther out. And that is that really, ideally, you would want universal arbitrage-free prices in each block for all the swaps. But this is going to require, instead of thinking of these transactions, processing these transactions one at a time, and then updating the AMM state after each one, this is going to require us to think of um, the block more as a whole. Okay? And I would argue that's the direction we need to go. Thinking of 
those, that transaction by transaction processing, that is something that's kind of a paradigm that's left over from general purpose blockchains, right? And I think that that's something we should leave behind. Um, so I think it's clear that uh, application-specific blockchains broaden the design space for AMMs and for other applications pretty dramatically. I think you'll sort of the common theme here in each of these examples was that we are constraining, either constraining the block producers more or changing the constraints on the block producers specific for our application, in our case, an AMM. Right? And I think that is something that we can do for a number of different applications. So I think there's sort of takeaways here, whether you're looking at an AMM-specific blockchain or a blockchain-specific for something else. Polkadot really takes care of a lot of some of the, the things that the AMM chain builder doesn't want to worry about with its shared security and communication protocol. So that makes Polkadot a really nice ecosystem to build this in. And I should say, we have a thriving e .sama ecosystem, right? And that's also really critical. So uh, we at HydroDX are excited to be exploring these ideas. And if you are too, let's do that together. All right, thank you.